Has anyone ever criticized you by saying, you're acting like a Neanderthal? Well, today on In Grace, find out how that's actually a compliment. Ever since I was a boy, I've been fascinated with God's creation. I'm traveling the planet to tell His story about His world. I'm Jim Scudder Jr. Come with me on another exciting adventure in grace. Hi, I'm Jim Scudder. Welcome to In Grace. And today we have an exciting guest. His name is Dr. Jerry Bergman. Dr. Bergman is brilliant. He has multiple graduate degrees. He is a PhD. He's taught science for over 25 years. He's written 20 books and 800 articles. And today he's going to tell us why Neanderthal is not a missing link. And it's been used for decades as proof that we evolved from ape-like creatures. But we didn't. The Bible says that we were created uniquely and differently in the image of God. Not only did God form us from the dust of the ground, but he also breathed into us the breath of life. We have an eternal soul. And so that varies completely differently from Darwinian evolution. So what we're going to do today is talk about missing links, talk about Neanderthals, and talk about how that so-called evidence is no evidence at all. You're going to love today's In Grace. Dr. Jerry Bergman, great to have you again on In Grace. Thank you much. And we're going to talk about something that if you say this to someone, it probably won't be taken as a compliment. You remind me of a Neanderthal. Yeah, you'll probably get shunned or slapped or lose a friend. <laughs> but uh, you, you were telling me about a situation where you were in church and you said the person behind you looked like a Neanderthal. Perfect, perfect And, and to, to you, that's a huge compliment and it really is a compliment. But I think if you got up and, and took his picture and said, you remind me of a Neanderthal, he probably wouldn't have taken it that well. I have a feeling that that's true. <laughs> and your wife was telling you, don't do it, Jerry, don't do it. Yeah, don't, did you better not. I think your words were, you better not. <laughs> you better not. <laughs> and so it's, it's wise that we listen to our wives. Yeah, it often is. <laughs> but a lot of people think of Neanderthal as kind of a caveman and grunting. And, you know, a lot of times men get stereotypically labeled as, a, you know, a caveman. We like to eat our meat. And I had you over for dinner uh, Sunday and we had these beef short ribs and it looks like a, a prehistoric dinosaur bone and you're kind of, well, you didn't, you were too polite, but I picked up the bone and I was chewing on it. So that's the idea we have of, of cavemen or Neanderthal. Right. And it's been used as a missing link for the evolutionary theory uh, transition between monkey and man. For a century it was used. I collect old textbooks and almost every old biology book that I have from 1900 to about 1957 or 58, as a Neanderthal, as a missing link. Now the show's about the Neanderthal, but mm -hmm. let's first talk about the idea of missing links. Okay, so if we evolved, as Darwin said, and, and others now believe is no longer a theory, it's, it's a fact, was what people say, but the Bible has nothing about evolution in it. So I would say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is the better understanding of how we got here. But let's say evolution is true, wouldn't you find thousands and thousands, if not millions of missing links, the transition from ape to human would be massive if it were even possible. Right, now of course you have to look at conditions that favor preservation. And there are many parts of the world like deserts or like dry areas, because water of course deteriorates bones quickly. So if you have dry areas and there are many parts of the world which are very dry, you would preserve very well many of the links, many of the bones to show the links existed. But there really haven't been that many links presented. So you'd have, I would, I would even say maybe a handful of man, monkey to man links uh, that have been presented as evidence. What there, are some of those? There are very few and most have been refuted by other fellow paleontologists. But the ones that have been around for a century are Java man and Piltdown man, which is a fraud, well known as a fraud, and then uh, Peking man. So these are the main, Java man, Peking man, and Neanderthal man are by far the most common. And these are commonly found in textbooks. In fact, many have the charts showing the first, the Piltdown man, and then leading up to modern man. 
And invariably, Neanderthal is in there as well as the Java man and Peking man. Now, you said fraud. What, explain that. Well, they found out that, indeed, it wasn't what they thought it was, which is interesting when you read the different books, which not only have Piltdown Man there, but they've got a family, and they've got his lifestyle, and they've got what he'd like to do, and his interests, and so on. And so they found basically now, which in 54, I believe, they found that it's a fraud, deliberately a fraud because, well, I'll give you several examples. The teeth were filed down to look like ape-like teeth, and they not only saw they were filed down, but they saw the file marks when you look at them with a small magnifying glass. And they, they dyed, the teeth were also dyed with Van Dyke brown. They know now the color they used. And so it was clearly openly a fraud. And they think the so-called finder of it is the one who perpetuated the fraud. Huh. Well, you would be pretty famous if you found a missing link because there aren't many. And he was famous, yes, mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the finder, the finder. But, but was... still in most people's minds, I think they think there is still a lot of evidence between apes or monkeys and man, but there, there isn't. You're saying that these ones that were held up for, for years are, are discarded now. Discarded or there's a lot of controversy, so much that you really can't make many claims. Uh-huh. Like Java Man, for example, they have part of a skull, a small part of a skull, the top part, and they have a leg bone, and that's it. And there, I think there's a couple of teeth as well. And Peking Man, the same thing. All they have is fragments. And as Mark Twain said, we take some bone fragments and a ton of plaster, and that's how we get our missing links. Well, and then we have a lot of artist interpretation in these. Uh, you know, like you said, the whole family, what they like to do. With, and we don't have any evidence. There isn't any evidence of that. That's true. But again, artist interpretation and artist Privilege is a very important way you illustrate things. And it also locks in your mind once you see that picture or that you know display at the museum, it just makes it real to us as, okay, this was a ape-like creature, but it had human features and characteristics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's not, that's not true. That's, that's not true, no. Okay, so let's come to Neanderthal, which again is, is this idea of, of a caveman and a real wild uh, man. And they did find these fossils in caves, these bones in Mm -hmm. caves. So I would think that by saying caveman, that's an accurate statement Mm -hmm. by and large. But when we think they're primitive or not intelligent, nothing could be further from the truth. Right. And now we know Neanderthals made musical instruments. In fact, they were pretty high quality. And we know they buried their their dead. We know they used flowers during their funerals. We know that they had good culinary skills. And so we know a lot about them from the findings we found because there's so many Neanderthal bones they found and there's so many artifacts that were found with the bones. And as you mentioned, many were found in caves, partially because caves was a good place to live and caves are still around. Neanderthals probably lived in tents or in shacks and so on, but those buildings aren't around anymore. So therefore the main evidence we have of their abodes was the caves because well, they're survived for many, many decades. And so this is the Neander Valley in Germany, Neanderthal, Neander Valley, uh, is where they were originally discovered. The first one was discovered in Neander Valley, right? But they're finding more uh, in different places, in European areas and other places. But what you're saying is, and what even paleontology is saying, these are humans. Right, didn't say that until recently. And what happened was they, once they had a complete skeleton, they have people who are experts and putting flesh on the skeleton. And what they did was take the skeleton, put the flesh, the bones, the skin, and dress them up. And then from that, we know that indeed they look just like you and I. In fact, it said if you put a suit and tie on Neanderthal, he walked down Main Street, you wouldn't notice anything any different. Now, they didn't have certain traits. They had good body builds. They were strong. They were powerful. They'd make good football players. And they also had a brow ridge above the eye, which I wonder why today we don't have that because that would protect the eye from injury. And one of the worst things you can face is injury of the eye because blindness is not you know, very good. Another feature of Neanderthal is the brain cavity size. Explain that. The brain cavity size is a little bit larger than we, about 100, 150 cc's larger than modern humans today. And that may be partially because it, was, it had a bigger body. It was shorter, but it had a bigger body. So the body proportion was larger, so therefore he had a larger brain. But that, of course, is not what you expect from evolution. You expect a smaller brain because the theory is we evolved from monkeys that had small brains and we evolved into humans with large brains. And here this supposed link had a larger brain than the average human today. So therefore, this caused some, some uh, question even way back 50, 100 years ago. 
Now, this is interesting because you actually did a DNA test on yourself. Right, of me. And were you surprised when you got back the results and it had what in it? I was surprised that I have 35 genes, which is a high percent compared to most people that did the test of a high percent of Neanderthal genes. And so I would be, I forget, four or five percent Neanderthal. That's incredible. But, and and you'll, you'll see people today, and they have a certain build, so barrel-chested, shorter, ridge, eye, eye, brow eyebrows, ridge, yeah. Yeah, that are distinct and, and heavy, uh, but, but humans. And you actually had an example of a politician in Russia that has these features. Mm -hmm. Very much so. In fact, probably more so than many Neanderthals. And he's a politician. He was a member of Congress in the Soviet Union. And clearly a profile shows that he has some Neanderthal traits. And then they show his family and his wife, totally normal, to attractive woman, his two children, beautiful children, attractive people. And so they did not inherit those Neanderthal traits. But then again, of course, they have some from mom and some from dad. And I guess they got most of the mom traits. <laughs> We would love to get some great resources into your hands, and you can only get these products from us here at InGrace. The first one is a walk through Noah's Ark. You get to see the full scale Ark in Kentucky, and we were led on an incredible tour, and I'd love to send you that DVD as a thank you for your gift to InGrace. If your gift is over $35, let me send you two more exciting DVDs. One is a walk through the Creation Museum with Ken Ham, and the other is a dinosaur dig with Dr. Carl Ball. I would love to send these to you today, and your gift will help more people hear the truth about our great creator. According to the Bible, God formed man last. Right. And he formed man differently. You know, in, in the Bible, it says God spoke and these things came into existence. But when it came to man, it says God formed us from the dust of the ground and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. So I think that's more than just air coming in and out of our lungs. I think we have a spirit, you know, a soul. Yeah. And we have, there's so many differences. You know, people say, well, let's study the, the monkeys and the apes and you can see all the human characteristics. Well, uh, first of all, they don't walk upright. They don't. Maybe a little bit here and there, but they don't. Uh, there's the features like the jaw and, and so many differences. But it's more than that. It's just the the ability to uh, to write a poem or create a, an orchestra or or to 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 love and you know all the all the different things that make us unique. And, and the Bible says that we're made in the image of God. So what we're finding is, as a scientist, what you're finding is. The Bible, what the Bible says about origins of man is, is similar to what you're finding scientifically. Exactly. I, we don't very easily confuse an ape and a man. And there are differences where even from 100 feet away, you'd notice there's a very clear difference. And so and that's, of course, the physical differences. But the psychological and mental differences are enormous. They've tried and tried to teach apes to do things like have a language, a sign language. And they've been fairly successful through a lot of repetition. That animals can learn a lot through repetition and reinforcement, but there's still a chasm between apes and humans. They haven't been able to bridge, although they would like to because then we could have apes do jobs in the factory that we don't want to do. <laughs> but they haven't found that very successful. And they've tried and tried and tried. And even with a lot of patience and a lot of time, again, you can teach apes to do certain things, but like you say, they can't write a poem. They can't, they can't speak. They can mouth sounds, but they can't use language as we can. Huh. They can't create books like Shakespeare. We have a pretty famous museum here in Chicago called the Field Museum of Natural History. And uh, the one that started a, a big uh, a shopping store, Marshall Fields, which has now become Macy's, funded this, uh, this museum, and it's world-class. Uh, but they, they had uh, on display not that long ago uh, to Neanderthals. Right, mannequins. That, the mannequins that they've since taken down and hidden somewhere. Yeah, and it's interesting because those mannequins, photographs of them are a major part of many textbooks. And so this was seen as what they looked like back in the days when they were around. And I would love to raise some money and buy these and put them in a creation museum somewhere. 
I have a feeling they wouldn't sell them, but I know they might. Maybe they were going to raise money and you give them $10,000 for them, maybe they'll sell them and we could put them in a creation museum and uh, that would be, because people then can see what we used to believe about Neanderthals 50 years or so ago and they can see today they're just another people group. And that a visual c comparison, I think, would be very helpful. It's the artist uh, interpretation, and some of that's, uh, you know, sensational. Today, it's embarrassing for many evolutionists to bring these out. In fact, they don't want to. They want to destroy these. And that's why they took the mannequins out of the Field Museum, because it, it would be embarrassing today. People look at them and they say, that's a rape. It's wrong. It's not even close to what they look. It's just another people group. If they read National Geographic and Scientific American, of course, they would know that because they've had cover stories which point out that indeed this is just another people group. They're just like us. A little bit different body build, they're stockier, stronger, good football players, but nonetheless, they were people that looked just like you and I. We've also seen the, the trees in the textbooks of the human, kind of the human tree, and it, it, it's evolution basically. Right. Uh, talk about that. It's called a phylogenetic tree. And what they show is that the top of the tree is their Caucasians, and then Neanderthals, are not too far below that. And of course the blacks are in between Neanderthals and the higher level, the Caucasians. And so racist trees have been in the biology textbooks for about a century. And we look at them today and of course it's embarrassing for the evolutionists. But on the other hand, they're there in the book and they convince many people of the importance of racism, believe it or not. And I've often said, although this is another lecture, but I've often said that the main justification for racism was evolution, the main basis that evolution used to defend human evolution was racism. And they basically explain, how can we explain the inferior races? Mm -hmm. Evolution explains this. We have races that are less evolved than we are. So therefore, evolution depends upon racism in order to justify itself. And in many of these books that I, older biology textbooks that I've used, they indeed show that evolution has to be true because where do these inferior races come from? Of course, if they're not inferior, that does away with the argument for evolution, human evolution. And we would say absolutely they're not inferior. Right. That we're all uh, made in the image of God. And I love the idea that Jesus, the Son of God, came and died for the sins of all mankind. Right. And so that's uh, Caucasian, that's uh, darker skin, brown skin. And in tr true biblical Christianity destroys so-called racism. It does. Because we, we have to treat each other like Christ now, and that's everybody. Right. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve, and therefore we're all the same family, the same race, but different people groups. So the next time my wife Karen says, Jim, you're acting like a Neanderthal, I say, thank you, dear. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, dear. That's nice of you to say. <laughs> Dr. Bergman, thank you for thank being you. on In Grace. It's good to be here. You remind me of the most brilliant Neanderthal I've oh. ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a compliment. <laughs>
but yet he was killed. He was killed on a cross just as it had been predicted and he rose again the third day. And he poured out his blood for your sins and for mine. And he says, if you'll simply believe in me, trust in me, put your dependence in me, not a religious system, not in our works, but in him, Jesus, you will not perish but have everlasting life. It's by grace that you're saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus died for your sins and he's now offering that to you as a gift. Receive that gift called eternal life that Jesus is offering to you and you will be saved today. Now we can learn to live for him, to fulfill the purpose that he's created us for. And I hope that you find that today. We would love to get some great resources into your hands, and you can only get these products from us here at In Grace. The first one is a walk through Noah's Ark. You get to see the full scale ark in Kentucky, and we were led on an incredible tour, and I'd love to send you that DVD as a thank you for your gift to In Grace. If your gift is over $35, let me send you two more exciting DVDs. One is a walk through the Creation Museum with Ken Ham, and the other is a dinosaur dig with Dr. Carl Ball. I would love to send these to you today, and your gift will help more people hear the truth about our great Creator. I'd like to invite you to come on an In Grace adventure to the Grand Canyon. We're gonna be rafting the Colorado River for seven days with an incredible geologist named Andrew Snelling and wonderful astronomer named Danny Faulkner. We're going to film a deserving family having this adventure with us and you can submit an application to get that trip. Go to our website for all the details. Join us next week for a special episode of In Grace, a moon's view with Apollo 16 astronaut Charlie Duke. It's a big deal for mankind to have achieved, first of all, spaceflight, and second of all, landing, a soft landing on the moon yeah. with humans. It is, in my view, even now, 50 years after Apollo 11, the first landing, you shake your head and said, you know, how did we do it? It's a wonder. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.